Chapter Thirteen of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Thirteen: A Struggle for the Mastery. The school had closed on Monday evening as usual. The boys had been talking in knots all day. Nothing but the bulldog and the slender, resolute young master had kept down the rising storm. A teacher who has lost moral support at home cannot long govern a school. Ralph had effectually lost his popularity in the district, and the worst of it was that he could not divine from just what quarter the ill wind came, except that he felt sure of Small's agency in it somewhere. Even Hannah had slighted him, when he called at Means's on Monday morning to draw the pittance of pay that was due him. He had expected a petition for a holiday on Christmas Day. Such holidays are deducted from the teacher's time, and it is customary for the boys to turn out the teacher who refuses to grant them, by barring him out of the schoolhouse on Christmas and New Year's morning. Ralph had intended to grant a holiday if it should be asked. But it was not asked. Hank Banta was the ringleader in the disaffection, and he had managed to draw the surly Bud, who was present this morning, into it. It is but fair to say that Bud was in favor of making a request before resorting to extreme measures, but he was overruled. He gave it as his solemn opinion that the master was mighty peart, and they would be beat anyhow some way, but he would lick the master for two cents if he weren't so slim that he'd feel like he was fighting a baby. And all that day things looked black. Rolf's countenance was cold and hard as stone, and Shocky trembled where he sat. Betsy Short tittered rather more than usual. A riot, or a murder, would have seemed amusing to her. School was dismissed, and Rolf, instead of returning to the squire's, set out for the village of Clifty, a few miles away. No one knew what he went for, and some suggested that he had sloped. But Bud said he warn't that air kind. He was one of them air sort as died in their tracks, was Mr. Hartsook. They'd find him on the ground next morning, and he lowed the master were made of that air sort of stuff as would burn the doggone old schoolhouse to ashes, or blow it into splinters, but what he'd beat. Howsomedever, he said he was a-goin' to help, and help he would, but all the sinnow and gollier wouldn't be no account against the cute they was in the head of the master. But Bud, discouraged as he was with the fear of Rolf's cute, went like a martyr to the stake, and took his place with the rest in the schoolhouse at nine o'clock at night. It may have been Ralph's intention to preoccupy the schoolhouse, for at ten o'clock Hank Banto was set shaking from head to foot at seeing a face that looked like the master's at the window. He waked up Bud and told him about it. "'Well, what are you a-tremblin' about, you coward?' growled Bud. "'He won't shoot you, but he'll beat you at this game. I'll bet a hoss.' and me too, and make us both as shamed of ourselves as dogs with tin kittles to their tails. You don't know the master, though he did duck you. But he'll larn you a good lesson this time, and me too, like as not. And Bud soon snored again. But Hank shook with fear every time he looked at the blackness outside the windows. He was sure he heard footfalls. He would have given anything to have been at home. When morning came, the pupils began to gather early. A few boys, who were likely to prove of service in the coming siege, were admitted through the window, and then everything was made fast, and a snack was eaten. "'How do you low he'll get in?' said Hank, trying to hide his fear. "'How do I low? said Bud. "'I don't low nothing about it. You might as well ax me where I low the next shootin' star is a-goin' to drap. Mr. Hartsook's mighty uncertain.' "'But he'll get in, though, and tan your hide for you. "'You see if he don't. "'If he don't blow up the schoolhouse with gunpowder.' "'This last was thrown in by way of alleviating the fears of the cowardly Hank, "'for whom Bud had a great contempt. "'The time for school had almost come. "'The boys inside were demoralized by waiting. "'They began to hope that the master had sloped. "'They dreaded to see him coming.' "'I don't believe he'll come,' said Hank, with a cold shiver. "'It's past school time.' "'Yes, he will come, too,' said Bud. "'And he lows to come in here mighty quick. "'I don't know how. "'But he'll be standin' at that air desk when it's nine o'clock. 
I'll bet a thousand dollars on that. F he don't take it into his head to blow us up. Hank was now white. Some of the parents came along, accidentally, of course, and stopped to see the fun, sure that Bud would thrash the master if he tried to break in. Small, on the way to see a patient, perhaps, reined up in front of the door. Still no Rolf. It was just five minutes before nine. A rumor now gained currency that he had been seen going to Clifty the evening before, and that he had not come back, though in fact Rolf had come back, and had slept at Squire Hawkins's. "'There's the master,' cried Betsy Short, who stood out in the road shivering and giggling alternately. For Rolf at that moment emerged from the sugar camp by the schoolhouse, carrying a board. "'Ho, ho!' laughed Hank. "'He thinks he'll smoke us out. I guess he'll find us ready.' The boys had let the fire burn down, and there was now nothing but hot hickory coals on the hearth. "'I tell you he'll come in. He didn't go to Clifty for nothing,' said Bud who sat still on one of the benches which leaned against the door. "'I don't know how, but they's lots of ways of killin' a cat besides choking her with butter. He'll come in, ef he don't blow us all sky high.' Rolf's voice was now heard, demanding that the door be opened. "'Let's open her,' said Hank, turning livid with fear at the firm, confident tone of the master. Bud straightened himself up. "'Hank, you're a coward. I've got a mind to kick you.' You got me into this blamed mess, and now you want to crawfish. You just tetch one of these ear fastenings, and I'll lay you out flat of your back afore you can say Jack Robinson. The teacher was climbing to the roof, with the board in his hand. That air won't win, laughed Pete Jones outside. He saw that there was no smoke. Even Bud began to hope that Rolf would fail for once. The master was now on the ridgepole of the schoolhouse. He took a paper from his pocket and deliberately poured the contents down the chimney. Mr. Pete Jones shouted, Gunpowder! and set off down the road to be out of the way of the explosion. Dr. Small remembered, probably, that his patient might die while he sat here, and started on. But Rolf emptied the paper, and laid the board over the chimney. What a row there was inside! The benches that were braced against the door were thrown down, and Hank Banta rushed out, rubbing his eyes, coughing frantically, and sure that he had been blown up. All the rest followed, Bud bringing up the rear sulkily, but coughing and sneezing for dear life. Such a smell of sulphur as came from that schoolhouse. Betsy had to lean against the fence to giggle. As soon as all were out, Ralph threw the board off the chimney, leaped to the ground, entered the schoolhouse, and opened the windows. The school soon followed him, and all was still. Would he thrash? This was the important question in Hank Banta's mind. And the rest looked for a battle with Bud. It is just nine o'clock, said Rolf, consulting his watch, and I'm glad to see you all here promptly. I should have given you a holiday if you had asked me like gentlemen yesterday. On the whole, I think I shall give you a holiday anyhow. The school is dismissed and Hank felt foolish. And Bud secretly resolved to thrash Hank or the master. He didn't care which. And Mirandy looked the love she could not utter. And Betsy giggled. End of chapter 13